All right. So welcome back to the webinar, the two-part webinar. Tonight is part two, two out of two. And uh, I've been getting Baruch Hashem really beautiful feedback uh, since last night. People who have told me that they really, they felt that this content re resonated with them. And I think that's just uh, a proof of one of the things that we were discussing last night, which is you can't tell anybody anything they don't already know, but when you can re-present to them their own, uh, their own ideas in a, in a way that they can embrace them, that uh, you know, people really appreciate that. And, um, and that, that's the kind of feedback that I've been getting from people since last night, Baruch Hashem, that people are saying that it, it affirms things that they had sensed for a long time. And then again, that's what we spoke about last night. The, you know, we, the, 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 the lies have to be unlearned, but the truths can only be relearned because deep down we knew them already. Um, okay. So I'm going to tell you a, a, a story, a Balshemtev story. Uh, one of my favorite stories. In fact, I just told it uh, this Shabbos. We had some guests, and I, I told it again this Shabbos, but I don't get tired of it. The story is a story about stories, actually. And um, actually, somebody, one of my guests, described it as like the, the mother of all stories, because it's like a story about stories, and a story within a story. So if you like stories, this, this has got a lot of, you know, it's like the triple chocolate fudge cake. Um, who ends up paying for the books? What does that mean? I don't even understand what that question means. You're getting the books for free. I found a couple boxes of them in my house. I'm giving them to you. Just pay for shipping and handling. Okay. So the Baal Shem Tov, before he passed away, he gave instructions to all of his students as far as what their mission in life should be. Um, and one of these Talmidim, one of these disciples, it was named Rabbi Yankif. And he told Rabbi Yankif, your mission in life will be that after I leave this world, you should go around wherever you can get a gig and wherever you find listeners and you should tell them stories about me. You should tell Baal Shem Tov stories. And that's what happened. He went around and he would go from town to town and he would tell Baal Shem Tov stories. And many of the Baal Shem Tov stories that he told were stories that he had knew firsthand because he had been uh, the Baal Shem Tov student. So he, he, he had been part of many of the stories. Anyway, he was doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, after a while it got old. You know, life on the road. You know how it is. So he hears about an opportunity to um, basically make enough to retire. He hears there's this rich Jew who lives in Italy, and he loves Baal Shem Tov stories, and he'll pay you a gold coin for every Baal Shem Tov story. So he figures, well, I am the encyclopedia of Baal Shem Tov stories, so what I'll do is I'll go to this guy, and I'll just tell him all the stories, and I'll collect a fortune, and then I'll be able to stop traveling. I live a little bit, you know, a little bit better life. So uh, he goes to Italy and he finds this place where the guy, uh, where the guy lives, and uh, he's invited as his Shabbos guest. So uh, Shabbos Friday night, he's at the meal, and the wealthy uh, Jew, the you know. Lord of the Manor, I guess you call it, calls upon Rabbi Yankiv and he introduces him. He says, "This is Rabbi Yankiv. He is the he he was one of the Baal Shem Tov students, and he is one of the great experts to uh, you know one of the great experts in Baal Shem Tov stories. And he's here. He's joining us, and he's going to tell us a Baal Shem Tov story at the Friday night meal for Shabbos. Go ahead, Rabbi Yankiv, and." Um, Rabbi Yankiv cannot remember. I mean, this is ridiculous. He is the foremost expert, the world's foremost expert in Baal Shem Tov stories. 
and he's asked now to tell a Baal Shem Tov story, he cannot remember one of them. And he's just standing there dumbfounded and embarrassed. And he apologizes. And the host is very gracious and says, that's okay, Rabbi Yankov, you're tired from traveling, no doubt. You'll, uh, you'll tell us about Baal Shem story tomorrow at the tomorrow meal, at the day meal. So the Shabbos day meal comes around. And again, the uh, host calls upon, uh, calls upon Rabbi Yankiv, says Rabbi Yankiv is going to tell us about Shem Tov's story. And he can't remember a single story. And the host again is very gracious about it. It's not a problem. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Our guest, he, uh, he clearly wants to, you know, work up the suspense. That's fine. You'll tell us a story, Shalosh this at the third meal. And they try to do it again. Um, and they try Malava Malka, the meal after Shabbos, nothing. They try Sunday, nothing, you know, Sunday brunch, bagels and locks, nothing. Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday. Finally, it's Wednesday, and um, Rabbi Yankov has not remembered a single Baal Shem Tov story and realizes that it's futile. For some reason, all of the Baal Shem Tov stories he knows have been forgotten, by him at least. So his host comes to him and says, listen, I don't want to hold you here anymore. It's clear that this isn't going to work out, and uh, it's okay. In fact, I want to pay you something for your, for your time. And I'm going to arrange a wagon to take you to the town. And from there, you'll, you'll be able to travel wherever it is that you want to go. So the, the Lord of the Manor pays Reb Yankiv, And he gets him a, gets him a carriage, a little wagon. And the, the wagon is driving off of the property. And uh, Reb Yankiv is looking back at this big mansion where he would spent Shabbos and as he goes over the hill, <clears throat> the mansion disappears. Now he's out of sight. And as he's out of sight from the mansion, all of a sudden, he starts to possibly, maybe, kind of remember the beginning, at least just the beginning of a Baal Shem Tov story. And he screams to the driver, turn around, turn around, turn around right now. They turn around, they go back to the mansion. And if Yankiv jumps out of the wagon, he goes to the the, 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 the Lord of the Manor still standing there. And he says, I got to start right now. If I don't start, I, I, I might forget it. I remember the beginning of a Baal story. Let me talk. He says, go ahead. So Rabbi Yankiv says, it was a Matzah Shabbos. It was a Saturday night. It was a Saturday night. Oh, yes, this story happened to me. I was in this story. Yes, the Baal Shem Tov came to me. Saturday night, after Shabbos, and he said, Rabbi Yankov, get the wagon driver, get on the wagon, we're taking a trip. He didn't tell me where, we got on the wagon, and we started traveling at night. Now, the Baal Shem Tov, many times, he would have kfitzas haderach. The road would miraculously contract before him, and he would uh, cover great distances in a short amount of time. He says, Sunday morning, we arrived in a foreign land. I don't know what country it was. People were dressed differently. The architecture was different. It was a different country. Um, we were in some city. It was clearly, it was a city. And then in that city, we, um, it looked like people were very busy. It wasn't just a regular Sunday. It was like a special Sunday. And I wasn't sure what. Then we went into the Jewish quarter. We went into the Jewish quarter and it was a ghost town. The Jewish quarter, it was a ghost town. There was not one single person to be found in the street. And we went to the, to a house. We knocked on the door and the woman inside screamed, go away. I'm never opening this door. And the Baal Shem Tov said, this is Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. I'm ordering you to open the door. And she opened the door and she screamed, get in here quick, get in here fast. And the Baal Shem Tov and I walked inside and she slammed the door shut and she locked the door and she said, you're crazy. How come you're walking around outside right now? Don't you know today is Easter Sunday and the bishop always grabs a Jew to execute, to burn at the stake publicly every Easter Sunday. And that is why no Jew is to be found in the streets right now. What you're doing is absolutely reckless and dangerous. So uh, the Baal Shem Tov says to me, we're inside this house. The Baal Shem Tov says to me, says, Rabbi Yankiv, go to the uh, town square and you will find the bishop building a platform. And um, he's, he's the one up on the platform running things. 
you tell the bishop that uh, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov says that he should come see him now. So I, I walked outside of the house, and when I opened the door, the woman screamed again. And she locked it quickly behind me. And I walked to the where I assumed the town square was, and I found the platform. There was a platform there, and there was someone standing up there, clearly a like clergy, a priest of some sort, and he was giving everyone orders. And I realized what it was. It was uh, he was building a platform to burn someone at the stake. It was going to be an execution. And this guy was the one who was clearly in charge. He must have been the bishop. And I said to him, I mean, what, what else can I do? My rabbi told me to do it, so I did it. I, 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 look, I looked at him, and I said, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov says you have to come see him now. And he looks at me, and he says, okay, in a half an hour. So I turned around, I went back, and I went into the house again. The woman screamed when I opened the door. And I told the Baal Shem Tov, the, uh, the priest, the bishop, says he'll come see you in a half an hour. And the Baal Shem Tov says, no, tell the bishop that I want to see him now. And so Rabbi Yankiv left the house. The woman screamed again as the door was opened. He says, I marched right up to the bishop. I said, no, the Baal Shem Tov wants to see you now. And like that, the bishop says, okay. And he walks down off the platform and he leaves the whole crowd there, the bloodthirsty crowd. He leaves them and he follows Rabbi Yankiv. Rabbi Yankiv says, I walked into the house when this time when I opened the door and the bishop was standing with me, the woman fainted. We came in, the Baal Shem Tov, there was a two-room house. The Baal Shem Tov told me to stay in the main room. He went into a back room with the bishop, and they were there alone for three hours. Couldn't hear them. I don't know what they spoke about. At the end of the three hours, the Baal Shem Tov came out of the room. The bishop did not. And I am so sorry. That is all I can remember. I don't even know what happened to the bishop. I don't know the end of the story. And the Lord of the manor, the wealthy Jew, looks at Reb Yankiv and says to him, you don't recognize me? Really, you don't recognize me? Reb Yankiv says, no, I don't. Don't think we've ever met before. The wealthy Jew says, I am the bishop. And Rabbi Yankov realizes that it's one and the same man. It is. Now he's confused. He says, I don't understand. The wealthy man says, I'm a Jew. I was born a Jew, raised a Jew. And one day, for whatever reason, I got a resentment against my family, against my community, and I ran away, and I decided to go live amongst the Gentiles. But, you know, being a, a Jewish boy, you always have to prove yourself. You know, they say the Jews are like everybody else, only more so. So among the, uh, the Gentiles, I had to become a priest. I became a priest. And then that, that wasn't even enough. I had to prove that I was the most virulent anti-Semite. And I started this terrible, terrible thing. I mean, I, it was just to prove, just to prove myself. I would, every Easter Sunday, I would make a public execution randomly of a Jew. And um, I did this for years, for years. And one night, Saturday night, the night before Easter Sunday, I was asleep in bed, and I had a dream that was so vivid. It felt more real than anything I'd ever seen while awake. I saw my soul being judged, and I saw my ancestors, my Jewish ancestors, crying out and begging the heavenly court for mercy. And the angel who was the judge told them, no, your, your, your son has blood on his hands. He killed innocent people, and there is no, uh, there is no path to penitence for him. 
And, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of this dream, I saw a man, uh, a rabbi. I knew he was a holy man. And he said, I will take responsibility that he returns in penitence. And uh, they asked him who he was. He said, Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. And then I woke up. And I knew it was real. Like I said, it was a dream, but it was realer than anything I'd ever seen while awake. And so then you, Rabbi Yankiv, when you came to the platform and you said, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov wants to see you, I wasn't all that shocked. I knew it was coming. Now, I told you in a half an hour, the reason I said in a half an hour is because the platform was built and everything was set up. A crowd had assembled. They wanted to see uh, an execution. So I was going to give them one last execution. I mean, what's one more? And uh, then you came back and you said to me, no. Well, Shem Tov says now. And uh, that's it. You know, what I thought I was going to do it one last time. I didn't realize that last time was the last time. I thought this was going to be the last time, but there was no this time. It was only the last time. Uh, funny how that works out. We never know when the last time is going to be. And uh, if you know when the last time is, <laughs> it's not going to be the last time. <laughs> Anyways, he says... Uh, I got off the platform, I walked with you, we walked into that house, that woman screamed, we went into the back room, and the Baal Shem Tov told me basically, uh, look, you got to get out of this life, you're going to sell all of your possessions, take a third of the money you make and bribe the church to let you escape, take another third and give it to the local Jewish community to try to pay them back for what you did, although money can never um, pay them back. But, uh, and then the third, the other third is you take that, and it was a huge amount of money. Uh, you go live on that and, and, and live a good life to the country. Be successful and live your best life as a Jew. And uh, so I said to the Baal Tov, fine, I'll do all of that. I'm ready to do it all right now. But <clears throat> that's enough? The Baal Shem Tov said, yeah, it'll be enough. He says, how, how, but how do I know that my teshuva that my penitence was accepted. And the Baal Shem Tov told me, very simple, I'll give you a sign. You will know that your penitence has been accepted in heaven when you hear someone else tell you your story. So you see, the, the wealthy man continues to tell Reb Yankif, that's why all these years I've been paying people to tell me Baal Shem Tov stories. Every coin that I gave a storyteller, it was with a little bit of anguish inside, realizing that my, my teshuva, my penitence, hasn't yet been accepted. Because every time they would tell me the story, and I would hope that it would be my story, and within the first couple words, I would realize, no, that's not mine. That's not my story. And I would be polite. I would listen to the whole story and I would pay them. But I, I, would, I would know that, no, it's not today. My, my penitence has still not been received today. Now, when you showed up, Rabbi Yankiv, I want you to know how excited I was because I knew that not only had you heard my story, but you were actually the only person in the world, alive in this world now, other than myself, who knows this story firsthand. So when you showed up, I recognized you immediately, and I was very excited. Today's the day. My, my teshuva, my penitence has been accepted. I'm going to hear my story. And you stood up at that Friday night meal, and I was ready to hear my story. And you couldn't remember a single story. And I understood very clearly that it wasn't the time. My penitence has still not been accepted, and, and, and I accepted that. And that's why I told you, you try again the next day. It wasn't you. It wasn't that you couldn't remember a story. It was that... I wasn't ready yet to hear my story and to be shown that my penitence had been completed. And then we tried the next day and the next day and the next day. Finally, I realized it's not happening. It's not happening. I have to let go of this. And I saw you get on the carriage and I saw you go over the hill. And when you disappeared over the hill and I couldn't see you anymore, that's when it became really real for me. I accepted the fact that the only person in the world who could know this story for firsthand had visited me had spent five days with me, could not remember a single story, and had left. And when you 
when your carriage went over that hill, I, I completely accepted it, that my teshuva, my penitence may never be accepted. And, and, and if that is what it is ordained in, in heaven, that is what's ordained. And I accepted it. And at the moment I accepted it, I saw you coming back over the hill. And you came running out of the carriage and you came running to me and you started, you say, I don't remember how it ends, but I remember how to start it. And I was thinking to myself, of course, you don't know how it ends. I'm going to tell you how it ends. But when you started it and I knew that was my story, immediately I knew it was my story. And now I thank you, Rabbi Yankiv, because now I know that I've completed my teshuva, I've completed my penitence, because I've now finally heard somebody else tell me my story. So, yeah, one of my favorite Baal Shem Tov stories. Why am I telling this? I mean, it's fun to tell stories. Why am I telling this? I saw in a mimer from the Rebbe, in uh, the Dvar Malchus. It was actually the mime that was in the Dvar Malchus last week for Parshas uh, Vayigash. So uh, over there, Vayigash is the name of the Torah portion, and that means he approached. Who approached? Judah approached Joseph. And uh, basically, uh, Judah is telling Joseph, you know, don't take Benjamin as a prisoner. Um, and he's challenging him. And then uh, at one point, Judah tells Joseph the whole story. Now, he doesn't know yet that this is his brother. He thinks it's the viceroy. Of, well, it is the viceroy of Egypt, but he doesn't know that the viceroy of Egypt is his own brother. So he starts telling Joseph the whole story. We have this brother and, you know, we were separated from him, and now we're, we're looking for him. And he's talking about Joseph. So he's telling Joseph his story. And um, the Rebbe asks a question in this Maimer, in this discourse. Why is Judah telling Joseph this story? This is Joseph's story. I mean, Judah doesn't know who he's talking to. So, you know, that kind of, that, on a simple level, that's the answer. But... Torah is very sparing in its language. So why is why is the Torah expending all this time, all these words, relating how Judah is telling back Joseph Joseph's own story? And basically, the the, the discourse says that Judah is is bittel. Bittel means selflessness or complete surrender. Um, Yehuda in Hebrew, Judah is Yehuda, which is the word Hoida. Uh, which is also like Maida Ani. I I acknowledge, I give thanks. In in the holy tongue, gratitude and acknowledgement are one and the same. You know, some people uh, they only acknowledge that what they're grateful for, and until they're grateful, they reserve the right to live in denial. <laughs> but in the holy tongue, we are grateful because we acknowledge. If something's real, then we know it's real good even if we can't see it. And so if we can acknowledge something's real, we can also be grateful for it. And that's selflessness and that's surrender. Anyways, so Judah is, is that. And he's telling Joseph his own story. And basically what he's doing is, you know, surrender is also another way of saying that is transparency. When the ego, the EGO, the edging got out has been removed and the godliness is just shining through un unobstructed. So basically, Judah, who is Bittel, who is selflessness, um, is telling Joseph his story, and Joseph's hearing his own story. And even though Joseph is such, for some, such a lofty level, and in some ways, actually, Joseph's on a higher spiritual level than, than Ju Judah. But Judah has this special uh, aspect of this, this transparent selflessness. And when he tells Joseph's story, Joseph's hearing his own story in a new way that he never heard it before. And instead of hearing the story as a drama that happened down here in this world, uh, a story about brothers, about betrayal, he hears it as a story about God. He sees the God in the story. And after he's finished hearing the story in that way, it's his own story. He lived this story. It's not that he needed Judah to tell him what happened. He knew what happened. He lived it. But when he heard it from Judah, 
he saw the God in it, in his own story. And that's when he was able to tell Judah and all of his brothers, I'm Joseph. You guys didn't send me here. God sent me here. The fact that I ended up in Egypt as a slave, and then I rose to prominence and to power, that was what God planned for me. He is the only author of my life. You guys didn't do that to me. Nobody did anything to me. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. I'm not passive. No human being came and derailed the plan of my life. This whole thing, every bit of it, has all been a dynamic relationship with, with, with an intimate relationship with, with, with God who has led me every step of the way. And, and that's, that's why I'm here today. And that's, that's my story. <laughs> so Judah had to tell Joseph his own story. And then Joseph was able to see himself and his whole life and everything that had ever happened to him on a completely new level. Why am I telling you all of this? Because last night, one of the things we really, really, um, we made hay of is helping people rediscover their own truth, giving back to people the truth that they already told you. And Maybe another way of saying it, which I don't know if I said clearly enough, but I'll try to say it now, is that I want to give you back your story in a way that you see the God in it. Because when you finally hear your story, something transformative happens. But it has to be a story. I mean, we spoke about this last night, and if you're just watching this uh, part two on its own, I recommend you go back to part one before trying to watch part two. It has to be a story. A story has conflict. Okay? So the person's coming to you. They're not calling you because they're having a great day. In fact, usually if somebody got to the point where they're humbling themselves to reach out for help, they're probably having a bad day, perhaps even the very worst day of their life. Very often, if somebody reaches out to you, just remember they're having the worst day of their life or they wouldn't have been humble enough to reach out. So we have to remember a story has conflict. I'm going to talk about a few things that a story has, but one thing is a story has conflict. Okay, conflict. <laughs> right here is conflict. There's a problem. Another thing, though, is that a story has a resolution, a good story. And if it's a really good story, the resolution flows naturally from the conflict. In other words, you know, you can have what they call uh, a plot contrivance. Uh, and the, this goes back to the Greeks. The Greeks used to do this. Sometimes they would have a story that was, you know, here's the, the occupational hazard of writing a, a, a story is that conflict is good for a story. But if you, if you ratchet up the conflict to such a point where you can't even, you know, you've painted yourself into a literary corner and you can't even get out of it. So what do you do? Uh, they had the dia, dias ex machina. The, it literally means God out of the machine. They had a guy with a crane and an actor suspended from a crane, and he would fly onto the set, and he'd be one of the gods, and he would just say, presto, you're all cured. You know, everything is better, right? And, uh, you know, that's so uh, we, now we call it the Hollywood ending, but the Greeks did it long before Hollywood did it. And that's basically an inorganic, artificial, superimposed resolution to the story. And that's, that's not a good ending. That's not satisfying. But a good story, and God is a great author. God's the best author. Uh, a, a, good, <laughs> a good story has conflict and resolution, and a really good story has a resolution which naturally follows from the conflict. So, um, the problem is the solution. The question is the answer. God's the best author. He only writes beautiful stories. By beautiful, by the way, I don't mean there's not ugliness in the stories, but 
that's what a beautiful story is. A beautiful story has conflict, and conflict means that there is ugliness to be overcome until Mashiach comes. So the problem is the solution because the conflict is creating the resolution. The conflict becomes the resolution. It's like Golas and Geula, right? The exile and the redemption, the messianic redemption, the perfect world. It's not just that redemption is something that comes after exile. No, it's redemption is something that comes from exile. And if it weren't, Hashem would have never put us in exile. Get what I'm saying? It's not like a timeout corner, and when you're good, you can, you know, come join the rest of us. What's the point of that? No, it's something you have to go through that hurts like hell, and it's dark and it's scary, but the benefits of having gone through it are far greater than the security and the safety of never having gone through it in the first place. If that's not the case, then it's a zero-sum gain. And then what's the point? It's like digging a hole and filling it up again. But, you know, it's like on a cosmic level, the world goes through dysfunction so that when it's healed, it's healthier than it was before it got sick. And on an individual level, each one of us goes through struggles so that at the end, we're going to come out better than if we had never had our problem. And you have to believe that. And if you don't believe that, you have no business listening to people. If you don't believe with your entire heart that the world and every single human being in it has a story and that that story is a conflict and that that conflict naturally leads to a beautiful resolution, that a resolution so wonderful that it could not have been achieved without the conflict and that the conflict itself was necessary in order to bring us to the resolution. If you don't believe that, you do not belong listening to people's personal stories. Because your whole job is to be able to listen and tell them back their own story, like Judah did for Joseph, so that they can hear it and say, there's the God in it. And what does it mean, there's the God in it? It means I can see how all of the conflict, all of the trouble, was only to take me to a higher level. And I wouldn't be here today where I'm standing today as a survivor, if I hadn't gone through what I went through. And that is your job. Your job is to tell the person their hero's tale. And I want to now add one more element to it, because I said a story has a few things. One is a conflict, and a conflict that leads organically to a resolution. Another thing that a story has is character development. And if it's a really, really good story, the conflict resolution and the character development are one and the same. In other words, the main character has a problem. And when he or she solves that problem, A, he or she comes out ahead, you know, better than if he or she never had the problem in the first place. That's what we already said. But B, the main character becomes a better person. So it's not just the problem is and the situation went from problem to solution, but the person went from weakness to strength. So it's not just, I'll use a little lambda terms here. It's not just the hefza, it's the gavra. <laughs> if I can speak in learning for a second. The hefza means the thing. The gavra means the person. So the resolution isn't just that there was a, a situation that got better, and now the situation is better for having been troubled, but there's also the person. The person is stronger. The person is truer. The person is more who he or she is really meant to be for having gone through the trouble. Okay? And then there's one more thing. And really, it's implied in everything that I said. Well, the second thing was implied in the first thing as well. And nevertheless, we have to say it. But this one's really implied. This one's really obvious. Someone's saying in the, in the comment, often the character development actually leads to the resolution. That's what I just said. I said they're one and the same. Are you saying something different? 
character development and the resolution of the conflict are one and the same in a perfect story, which Hashem only tells perfect stories. Clarify for me if you're saying something different than, than what I was saying, or if you're re re reiterating what I said. There's another component in a story, which is, and this is strongly implied, this is, this is obvious, but I'll say it anyway. There's a main character. <laughs> so if there's a conflict, a conflict for whom? And the resolu a resolution for whom? And certainly if there's character development, character development for whom? There's a main character, and every single person is the main character of their story. And what's so interesting is that Hashem has so many of us, but each of us is the only main character of our story. And yet your story intersects with so many other people's stories. In some people's stories, you are uh, a very important person. In fact, I think it's very important for each one of us to accept, especially if you've ever been hurt by anyone, I want you to accept, I want you to meditate on the following. If you've ever been hurt by anyone, I want you to meditate on the following. It's almost impossible that it will not be so that in somebody's story, you are the bad guy. Now, I'm not, this is not a moral equivalency. I'm not saying that whatever your bad guy of your story did to you is equivalent to whatever you did as the bad guy in somebody else's story. Okay? I'm, that, I'm not implying that, and it doesn't need to be implied. I'm just saying for the sake of the, the clarity that it brings us, just remember just like you have a bad guy in your story, you've probably been the bad guy in somebody else's story. I only say that to you, well, for two reasons. One is to humanize bad guys because that's part of the healing um, when you can forgive them and then move on. I, I think everyone should be forgiven, especially if it helps us get away from sick people. <laughs> especially the sick people need to be forgiven so that we can get the heck away from them and uh, not have them in our lives, right? So forgiveness is very important. Um, and, and if you're not ready to forgive, I'm not guilting you, by the way, because um, it's a process. But this, it's, uh, the other reason I'm telling you is to, to empower you and to realize that this bad guy in your story is just a guy just a guy, a flawed person who is doing their best in life, just like you're a flawed person doing your best in life. Um, so there's a main character, and you're the main character. And every person is, in their story, the main character. So what does that mean? that you recognize that the person who's talking to you and sharing with you is the main character in their story. It means that you understand that everything that they've been shown, everything that they know about was bishvili nivra ha'olam. The whole world is for my sake. I don't mean my sake, the listener. I mean my sake, the storyteller. Actually, <laughs> Storyteller in this case is, it's an interesting mind melt because you're playing the role of telling somebody their own story. So who's the storyteller? The guy who lived it or the one who tells it back? You know, it's like you're the biographer, I guess, is, the, is another way of saying it. So <laughs> whose story is it? The biographer or the, the person who, who, it, who it's about? Um. I guess it's a partnership. It's a little bit both. Well, it's really Hashem's story. Hashem wrote the story. And um, what I'm saying is when you're the biographer and you tell somebody their story, you have to remember they are the main character. And you have to realize then, therefore, everything is for them. Everything's for them. And what does that mean, everything's for them? I don't mean that in a sense of entitlement. I mean that in a sense of, actually the opposite of entitlement, in a sense of obligation. So any information that they tell you about their story, you have to be looking out for how it is mechai of them, how it obligates them. Oh, you have an opportunity? Yeah, okay. 
Oh, you have a talent? Oh, you were given certain resources? In other words, I'm always listening. When you're telling me your story, I'm always listening. Every detail you tell me is pertinent. And, and, and usually, if not always, it's information for, to, to help me find your calling, what you're obligated to do. And people love that, by the way. Because at the, end, at the end of the day, what do people want? They want to know what they're needed for. And if you can identify to somebody even a little bit about what they're needed for, about what their calling is, they, they feel so whole, so complete, so healed. So I'm always listening when you're telling me your story. You know, I know you're complaining right now because you're in pain, but I'm also listening and thinking, mm, there's an opportunity. Oh, there's something you have to offer. And, 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 and that's another thing. I'm overlooking when you're talking about your problems and, and you want to fix the problems by making something, somebody else do something different. I'm, I'm just skimming right over that in my mind. Because, a, because I know you can't control anybody else. But B, I know it's irrelevant to your story. A side character's character development, or I, I will go even further and say your spouse's character development is not your story. Your character development is your story. So if you're telling me about a problem, even though you're, you're looking for how to fix that person or that thing or that situation, I'm looking at it differently. I'm looking for how you are going to offer some healing to that situation. And, and then I want to point it out to you and say, by the way, you've just told me this whole long story about all these people who are causing all these problems and whatever. And I want to point out to you the incredible opportunities you have to be productive, to be a giver. Um, and then also, you know, even more specific, I want to point out to the person how their problems, I mean, this is a little bit how the character development and the conflict resolution go uh, hand in hand, how they dovetail, is I want to be able to tell you how precisely the painful things that you've been through were your proving ground where you learned the skills that you now need to be useful to fix the very problems that you're complaining to me about. So you're coming to me, you're telling me about a situation that's causing you trouble and you want us to figure out how to get the situation to go away so that you don't have pain anymore. And then what I'm really going to do is I'm going to flip it on you. I'm going to say this pain that you've been through. And if I listen to your story, I realize what you're talking about to me, you're talking to me about right now is actually a pattern. You've been going through it your whole life. And how do I know that? Because I know how God works with these things. I mean, I'm sure there's, I know there's much more infinitely beyond what we don't know about how God runs the world, but there are certain things that we do know. And that is that um, patterns repeat themselves. Lessons are taught until they are learned. So if you're coming to me about an unresolved issue, that means it's an unlearned lesson. And that means you've been, God's been teaching you that lesson over and over and over again. Okay. So I, I, if I will listen to your story long enough, I will be able to identify how you've learned this lesson multiple times. Now, I just want to, as an asterisk within that, I want to say sometimes people have learned the lesson and they graduated and then uh, there's postgraduate work. <laughs> sometimes people pass their tests and then they go to such a high level where God tests them again on a higher level. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes we go to a higher level of being tested. And so, and, but, but those are the people who will tell you, wow, <laughs> you know what? I learned this lesson 20 years ago. I thought that was the big break, the breakage and healing of my life. And now I realize, no, nope, I'm doing it again on a higher level, on a higher level. And those, those are the people who are just really easy to deal with because they're like, yeah, I already did this. I know this one. I know this lesson. I, I sat through this class. Just, you know, now this is like I sat through the 200 level class. Now, now I'm in the 300 level class. Okay, no problem. Anyway, um, So, yeah, anything you're telling me is all important information for me to be able to help guide you to what you need to do. It's only there because you need to do something. Someone wrote in the comments, and, I, and I, it's very, it resonates with me very much, about uh, you know, the story the Al-Tarebbe said, Younger man, do retz as I feel, vegan vas do darf, so vas be darf mendir. Young man, you speak so much about what you need, but what do you need it for? Uh, yeah, 
And uh, like Jim Carrey said, uh, I wish every man, woman, and child could have all their wildest dreams come true, right? Because his wildest dream came true. He made, I think, $10 million for a movie. He was the first actor to get paid, in Hollywood to get paid $10 million for one, one film. So, he, so his wildest dreams came true. And he says, uh, I hope that every man, woman, child will have all their wildest dreams come true so they can see that even after that happens, you're still not happy, right? So because people don't need to get what they need, they need to do what they're needed for. So when I'm listening to your story, I'm listening for what you need to do. A, because it's all you can control, right? You can't control others. But B, because that's, that's what's going to really satisfy you. That's, what's the, that's what the story is waiting for. The story is waiting for you, the main character, to step up and to offer this gift that you have to offer. And then as a corollary to that, I'm also listening to how all the trouble you've been through, all your conflict, actually made you the expert in this very particular form of healing that you have to, that you have to bring to your situation. Okay? So it's like, not only am I listening for what you can do and what you can contribute, but I'm listening for the evidence that I can prove to you when you're done talking, I can prove to you, hey, you know what this situation needs? It, it requires the very thing that you are the expert in. And how did you become the expert in it? You paid the price of admission. You went to the school of hard knocks. All the trouble you've been through, the pain, the loss, all of that, that you came out the other side, you're still here, you're surviving. That is how you became the expert to be able to offer to this situation exactly what's needed. And another uh, detail to this, I just before we move on, is that when, when you're looking at the person as the main character in their story, that also means not just the main character, that means the protagonist. There's no uh, anti-hero. We don't do anti-heroes over here, okay? There's just good guys. The main character is the good guy. He's a protagonist. And that means you are good. Your story is a story about a good guy. Your story is about the healing that you're going to bring to the world that God placed you in. Yeah, I know there's a lot of pain and a lot of trouble in the world. And that's why you're calling me and telling me about all this pain and trouble. But I'm here to tell you that you're precisely the guy because you're a good guy. And you've learned the precise skill set that is required for dealing with this situation. Okay, uh, I have a bunch of Q&A over here. <sighs> I'm getting a lot of side questions that are not pertinent, like we missed the AMI column, when are you going to write the AMI column? And I, I don't know if you heard last night, part one, I said, you're going to write the AMI column. I'm teaching you how to do it. I don't want to hear from anybody that they missed the column. Please don't tell me that. That only just makes me feel guilty, okay? And it doesn't, it's not productive. <sighs> I want you to write the column. I only ever started doing it because I thought it was a way of modeling how to take apart a question and answer it. I figured after a few years, people would be able to do it in their own way, with their own style, obviously. After eight years, I realized people are still just doing it for a Jerry Springer show. I don't know if Jerry Springer exists anymore. I mean, he probably exists, but if that, I just remember when I was a Bach in yeshiva, and we'd go to the, 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 the laundry to, you know, to wash our clothes. So the TV in the, in the laundromat would be Jerry Springer show, people throwing chairs at each other, right? So everybody, they like the daytime soap opera, not soap opera, the daytime talk show uh, drama. No, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not, I, I want to learn with you. I invite you to come learn with me. We have live Zoom shiurim multiple times a week. I'm posting shiurim on soulwords.org multiple times a week. Come learn with me. But no, I'm not doing the, the, the fortune teller business anymore, okay? No more uh, cold reading. I'm not doing that. No more Barnum statements. By the way, my favorite video on the, on the, on the whole YouTube, you can go Google it or YouTube it, um, is Orson Welles talking about cold reading and what it means to become a shut-eye. So I'm not a shut-eye. Shut-eye, 
after I, I got it. Now I got to share it with you. So that's my favorite video on the whole YouTube. Um, Orson Welles is talking, Orson Welles from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Before he was a filmmaker, he did Citizen Kane. He was, you know, on the radio. He did uh, War of the Worlds. But before that, he was a carny. He used to be a carnival guy. So he talks about, in the carnival, the fortune tellers, you know, like uh, the Wizard of Oz, right? So uh, fortune tellers, he said, one of the things you do is called cold reading. Cold reading basically means you make a bunch of uh, statements that could apply to anybody, and you just see if people react to it. So you say, like, oh, between the ages of 12 and 15, you went through a great change. And the person's like, oh, yes, that's, well, everybody went through a great change, you know. Or you have a scar on your knee. Well, everyone has a scar on their knee, right? So um, he says, but the, the occupational hazard of these people in the argo of the carnival folks is um, becoming a shut-eye. A shut eye means somebody who believes he actually has these powers. So really what you're doing is you're processing information very quickly. Uh, it's deductive reasoning. You're taking in all types of information and synthesizing it and, and making a coherent narrative. But the shut eye is the one who starts to believe he has spooky powers. So, no, I don't have any spooky powers. And uh, it, these are all very transferable skills, and that's why I'm doing it, to show you how it's done. It's all very transparent. We're pulling the curtain open. You can see there's just a guy, just me, and I'm showing you how it's done, and, and Adaraba, you do it, and you'll do it better than me. I'm getting questions about, where can you get the books in Canada? <laughs> why am I giving the books for free? Because <laughs> I just moved, and I have a bunch of boxes of them, and I want to give them away. Well, <laughs> The link for the books is in the chat. Should I bump it up again? I'll bump it up. But the people watching the replay, you, this this offer is on here. I just bumped it up in the chat. There's the the link for getting the books for for free. Um, somebody asks here in the question. Now here's a real question: um, <clears throat> Is it possible that not every story has an answer? I have to believe that if you're coming to me and I don't believe your story has an answer, then I'm that's malpractice tantamount to a defense attorney who doesn't believe that you have a case. If I don't believe you have a case, then I have to tell you to go to a lawyer who does. If you come to me and I agree to hear your story, I have to believe that your story is resolvable in this lifetime, in this lifetime. I'm not just going to tell you, well, you're here to suffer, and then I guess you'll come back in another Gilgul, and you'll reincarnate, and uh, you know, you'll fix it then. No. Somebody's asking here. Um, oh, there's a lot of interesting information about shut eyes. My hobby is performing magic. And there's some excellent literature out there on this. Orson Welles was a magician too. That's right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I could talk about that for hours, by the way. Um, someone's asking, can I send a recording? Yes. I said, <laughs> you know, I wish I had somebody who was fielding all these technical questions. Yes, we're going to send recordings. We're going to send links. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, you know, it's tough to like focus on something deep like this and look at questions about uh, links for free books and why are the free books and... <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. People are asking if we can do an example, if we can do role playing. No, we're not going to do role playing because I told you last night that will never work. It can't be fake, it would have to be real. And um, yeah, so I I'll tell you in a minute what we're going to do instead of that. I wanted to maybe have somebody come on and we could actually, someone who could be the um, case study and actually open up and I could actually deal with a real question. But I don't think that, for various reasons, I don't think that's going to work. So I, I came up with an alternative. Um, let me just see. There was one more question. I'm going to tell you what that alternative is in one second. Um, oh, I love this. Somebody said, I would venture to say, why can I not? Every time somebody sends me a question, I, I lose while I'm reading, please just don't send new questions because then I can't, I 
can't find the, the question disappears. I would venture to say that the people you listen to are sent to you by Hashem for a lesson for you as well. Their story is a message for you. Absolutely. I 100% agree. At the same time, you can't think about that while you're helping them. Um, at least I can't. I have to be there completely for you. And then afterward, yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Why would Hashem send them to me? Because I'm so smart? No, because I needed to hear their story and bear witness to their story because it's some healing that I needed to do. A hundred percent, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, somebody's volunteering to do the actual discussion about a trauma that happened in childhood, and I, I thank you for your bravery. I, I for various reasons, I don't think it's going to work well in this format, but thank you for for offering. Um, okay. Please stop stop sending questions for a second because I'm trying. Every time you send a question, it like flips the, the page and I can't. Um, okay, I, I can't do it because people keep sending questions and I. All right. So anyways, I'm going to move on. I said that we're going to. Um, do a case study. Here's what I'm going to try to do. Remember I told you last night that everything that I figured out about how to listen to people and how to answer them, I got from the Rebbe. So, and I told you about the Igus Kodesh, the Rebbe's letters. Um, one of the things uh, that I really, really like, these are not in the Igus. Igus are basically all Hebrew and Yiddish, but there are letters that the Rebbe wrote in English. English is my animal soul's first language. So when I have letters, not just that, that were translated into English, but the Rebbe himself wrote in English, uh, I, and it has a special place in my heart. And um, some people have asked me before, did the Rebbe really write English or he had secretaries who did it? No, 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 the Rebbe wrote English. And you can see on many of the English letters how the Rebbe corrects certain words in his own pen in English. So yeah, if, it's, if the Rebbe signed it, no matter what language language it was in, it was it was the Rebbe's own words. Okay, so I want to share something with you. Um, and before I do, I want to say like this. Okay, so why am I doing this? I wanted to sort of have a real person talk to me about their real problem and go through it, but then I decided, like I said, for various technical reasons, that's not going to work. But what I'll do, I think the next best thing, and in some ways it's even better, I want to look at a letter that the Rebbe wrote to somebody, and I want to point out to you what I think the Rebbe is doing. Um, so that way you'll have the advantage of having a real life issue. Now, obviously you don't see the letter the person wrote to the Rebbe, but that's one of the points I want to bring out is a good answer. You can tell from the answer what the question was, because the answer is just taking que the question and rearranging it and giving it back to the questioner. Like my favorite example of this is very succinct. Jonathan Sachs writes to the Rebbe, should I become the next chief rabbi of Great Britain? And the Rebbe circles the word should and circles the word I and makes the tr transposition mark, the editing mark of trans transpo uh, transposition, switching words. And then he, he slashes out the crooked part of the question mark to make it a dot, to make it a period, he sends it back to Jonathan Sachs. And now his own letter reads, I should become the next chief rabbi of Great Britain, right? So, and people always, you know, when the Ami column first came out, people were coming, oh, wow, it's amazing how you use the person's own words. Where do you think I got that from? But and, and using the person's own words, it's not just to save paper. It's not just to save time. It's what, what I told you be, before last night. People are telling you the answer. Now, maybe they're saying it to you from a position of confusion, like the wine rub story, and Suzich, but you have to send them back to themselves and find their clarity. So part of that is just taking their question and rearranging the Scrabble tiles and putting it back together and giving it to them and saying, here, you gave me the answer already. You put it to me as a question, but really your question was the answer. Um, okay, so I'm going to share with you a letter. And before I do, I'm going to say like this. This letter is about a very, very sensitive topic, and that's why I chose it, actually. That's why I chose it. Um, the letter is about suicide. Now, 
I want to tell you the backstory. About two, three years ago, a, there was an estate sale. Somebody passed away, an elderly person passed away a couple of years ago. And in their estate, which was sold off, it was discovered they had a letter from the Rebbe. A letter which the Rebbe had written to them over 50 years before their passing. This elderly person who passed away a couple of years ago, when they were young, back in the 1960s, they wrote a letter to the Rebbe and they said they were suicidal. And they got this response from the Rebbe. And um, obviously they didn't kill themselves because they passed away a couple of years ago. Now, before I share it with you, I just want to say, please, please, I beg of you. I beg of you. And you, if you're the kind of person who's going to even think this, I, I don't know what to do. I, I can't take responsibility for anyone who's going to think, oh, you know what? This is the letter you should give to anyone who's suicidal. God forbid. One of the things I told you last night, don't answer the question, answer the questioner. Everybody is different. Don't, and this is what I said last night also, but it's not about knowing what to answer, about knowing how to answer. It's not like there's one right answer for, for anyone who asks a certain question. No, there's a different right answer for each person who asks that question. In fact, there are, there are as many different right answers as there are different people asking the same question. So just because we're going to read something that the Rebbe wrote to someone who was suicidal and they lived doesn't mean, oh, this is the answer for anyone who's suicidal. This is what this person needed. Okay. Um, let's, let's share this. I just want to humbly, it's a little bit daunting, you know, taking the Rebbe's words and dissecting them, you know, like it's, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, literary criticism, God forbid. But uh, we're meant to learn from it, and that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to learn from it. Okay, so, everybody see that? Somebody in the chat, tell me you can see the, the letter. Yes, perfectly. Okay, and you see, there's a little COL water watermark on it because that's uh, where I found it, and I want to thank COL and Mika Sofer because uh, she has really been great in helping people find my work, and uh, I'm indebted to her for that. Uh, so there's a little COL plug. Baruch Hashem, I feel good I'm able to do that. Um, all right. You see, by the grace of God, 5721, that's 1961, Brooklyn, New York, greeting and blessing. Your letter of August 22nd reached me with some delay. Here, made it a little bit bigger. In it, you present a fairly clear picture of yourself, your background, education, spiritual vicissitudes. Vicissitudes means like your ups and downs, your challenges, your problems. And present state of mind, which you described in rather dismal colors, and you conclude with the hope that I may be of some help to you. Okay, so to begin with, the Rebbe repeats back to the person, what did you tell me, okay? You told me your story. And by the way, you told it rather well, if I may say so myself. You presented a fairly clear picture of yourself, okay? Just in case <laughs> you're going to doubt later on. Well, maybe he didn't understand. No, no, I understood. You told your story very clearly. And your backstory, right? Your background. And you told me about your problems, your spiritual vicissitudes. And you told me your present state of mind. So I get how you're, you know, how you're feeling right now. And now I just want to give you a judgment word. I'm making a judgment call. My commentary is, it was very dismal. Okay, if I, I'm just going to tell you, you didn't tell it objectively, you told it in a negative way. You gave it a negative spin. Okay, I think that's important. By the way, is the honesty of telling the person that uh, you know I'm making a judgment right now that I think. You are, you know, sometimes you're playing up your story. Sometimes you're playing down your story. Most people play down. Most people play down, meaning they make it, they make it darker 
than it needs to be. Uh, then, you know, but, but either way, either way, the, the point is to, you're trying to keep the person honest without being brutal about it. Okay. Permit me then, I'm continuing, permit me then to make an observation. See, this is so important. I'm not just rattling off information that I have that you don't have. I'm telling you something very pertinent because it's actually an observation about what you told me. All right. I'm not just telling you something that I happen to know because I'm educated. I'm actually making an observation about your words. That's very important. Permit me then to make an observation, which is strikingly evident, and I love that term, strikingly evident, meaning, look, I read your letter. <laughs> you wrote me a letter. I read it. And after I read it, like there was something that just jumped out at me from the general tenor of your letter. See, I love that also, the general tenor of your letter, meaning it's not necessarily just what you said, it's how you said it. That's what it means, the general tenor. Like the, the feeling, the emotional energy that was coming off of the page. So basically, the first step is like, okay, listen, here's the catalog. Here's the laundry list of what you did in your letter. Got it. Okay. Now, I want to tell you, I think it was kind of dark. And I want to make an observation about the general tenor, meaning the, the feeling that you were you've, you're conveying. And which, I be and which I believe also holds the clue to the solution. See that? I'm going to point out to you the problem. Not the problem that you were, that you were, you had your list of complaints. That's not what I'm, the problem meaning the dark tone that you gave your story. And I believe that when I point it out to you, I'm not just pointing it out to you for the sake of pointing it out to you. I believe that that also holds the clue to the solution. Again, the problem is the solution. The problem is the solution. Okay. And again, this person said that they were, they didn't want to live. Okay. I, I definitely put this letter in the category of do not try this at home. I would not have the guts to speak this way to somebody who is feeling like that. And uh, that's not the point. That's not the point of the letter for me. I can learn a lot of things from this letter that I can apply to less intense situations. That's how I take it. I can learn certain principles, which I'm confident to apply to less intense situations. More intense, I'm not confident to apply it, and I wouldn't. Okay? So just to repeat that disclaimer. All right. Let's continue. Your whole letter, two and a half closely typewritten pages, okay? Basically, that I've been, why is that ever saying this? I mean, in my mind. It's like, in case you think that I'm jumping to conclusions with very little evidence. Trust me, you gave me a lot of information. You gave me two and a half closely typewritten pages. It was more than enough evidence to be able to come to these conclusions. Okay. Is full of your own expectations and disappointments as if everybody owes you everything, but no one has a claim on you. Whoa. That's rough. But you see where this is going. You see where this is going. I told you before. I want to speak to you, main character of your life, and be mechayev you, to use the Hebrew term. I want to obligate you. You didn't come to me so that I could just agree with you that there are a lot of problems in the world. That's not why we're talking. You came to me so that I could be compassionate, yes, but also so I could put the onus back on you of what you need to do, what you're needed for, what you're needed for, what you're needed for, okay? And if I'm really going to do justice to this relationship, I need to identify, at least in part, what I think you're needed for because your healing is going to come about when I can give you a glimmer of what you're needed for. So that's why this is happening here. It's not to flip it on the person. Oh, you think you got problems? I'll give you something to cry about. That's not, God forbid, that's not what it is. It's, I'm trying to set you free by showing you that you are the one who has what to offer the situation. I'm empowering you and I'm obligating you. All right, let's continue. 
yet even a brief reflection will clearly reveal that the universe we live in is, in, is ordered in a system of give and take. By the way, that is so rich. You could meditate on that for hours. The Rebbe just told us a, a, a rule of the universe. You know, it's like as, as predictable as the law of gravity. The world is built on a system of give and take. Nothing moves in one direction. It has to be dynamic. You have to give in order to get. Okay, let's continue. And the personal universe of the individual, the microcosm, must likewise conform to this system of reciprocal relationship. I love it. Reciprocal relationship. Consequently, when one disrupts or distorts this system, this is so beautiful. The Deb is basically saying, look, God built a world. That world has laws, just like, like I was saying before, the law of gravity, just as real as the law of gravity, more real. You cannot fight the reality. The Rebbe calls it distor disrupting or distorting. Okay, this, you, there's, no, there's no hack. There's no way around it. There's no way to simply get what you want without giving. It doesn't work. It cannot work that way. It must necessarily, so if you disrupt or distort the system, the give and take of the, of the world, it must, it must necessarily bring about a distortion in one's immediate surroundings. Oh my God. So basically it's a ripple effect that if you are not respecting the reciprocal relationship in the universe, you're going to cause dysfunction around you. And especially, and you see the Rebbe's holy handwriting there, the Rebbe wrote in, in English especially, and especially, see it said even before, the secretary typed even, the Rebbe crossed out even, and this is especially, especially is the opposite of even. Like, and even in one's inner life? No, and especially in one's inner life. If you don't respect the system the way the universe was built, it's going to cause problems, especially in your inner life. What's inner life? Your thoughts, your feelings. So yeah. If you're not respecting the system the way the world was built, which is that you got to be a giver, it's going to cause you disease, dis-ease. Now, how, how's everybody doing? You holding in here? Can I uh, can continue here? Yeah? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, good. All right. Now, Judging by your own description, I love it, I love it, I love it. Again, again, see, this is important. This is important. This is so important. You have to keep coming back to this. You have to keep saying. And that's what people always say, like, oh, in your letters, you quote the person's letter to them back. And you keep quoting it back. You keep quoting it back. Keep yes, you have to do that. You have to do that. You have to remind them. I'm not telling you this. You told me this. Now, judging by your own description. Okay, I got this from you. Divine providence and the society in general have been quite generous to you. That's a judgment. Okay, that I was saying, I'm judging based on you. You gave me the data, I'm coming to the conclusion. You presented the data, even with your dismal picture, the, the dismal colors that you gave it, and I could say that life's been good to you. And, and, and I'll get specific in case you, it's too wishy-washy for you. You've been gifted with more than the average measure of intelligence and mental capabilities. Now, let me ask you a question. How would the Rebbe know that the person has more than the average intelligence and mental capabilities? And don't say Ruach HaKadosh, because if it's Ruach HaKadosh, I can't learn from it, because I don't have Ruach HaKadosh. How would the Rebbe know from two and a half pages of closely written, typed words? You can tell from one para you can tell from one comment on the internet whether somebody is intelligent. Okay, two and a half pages, you could probably guess their IQ within five numbers. So the Rebbe says, 
You've been given, gifted, I'm sorry, you've been gifted with more than the average measure of intelligence and mental cap capacities. You've been given opportunities of education, etc. How would the Rebbe know he's been given opportunities of education? Well, because remember, at the beginning, the Rebbe said, you told me your whole life, your background, your education. So he probably imagined, and then I went to this school, and they were jerks there, and then I went to that school, and they were jerks there. <laughs> but the Rebbe is also, you know, he's keeping track, and, uh, and the Rebbe is saying, okay, well, you were given a pretty good education, right? So you, you're, you're intelligent, and you're educated. Uh, in other words, in other words, let me interpret this. You've been on the receiving end. Oh my gosh! Basically, that I was saying back to this person their life story. This person thinks their problems are whatever they are identifying as their problems. That I was saying your problem starts much deeper than that. Your problem starts from the fact your whole life you received, 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 received. You've been constantly receiving. But forgive me for being so blunt. And you have to say that. You have to say, forgive me for being so blunt. It did not occur to you. Judging from your letter. Again, judging from your letter. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the evidence that you gave me. Okay, it did not occur to you, judging from your letter, that you might owe something to the society, that you might have obligations to participate in it actively and help to better it by putting to good use some or all of the mental gifts and capacities with which you have been endowed. Again, you have to be mechai of the person. You have to figure out what they're needed for. They didn't come to you to fix the things that they, they, they think they need. They really came to you to find out what they're needed for. Heaven knows that our society is far from perfect, and there is much to be done in the way of raising its standards of justice and morality. It is the basic duty of everyone to contribute one's share toward this end. Okay. So far, I've been speaking in general terms. What does that mean in general terms? <sighs> the Rebbe spells it out in a second, but basically the Rebbe is saying, what I've said to you so far just has to do with respecting the reality of the universe, which is everything has to be give and take. You have to give. You can't just get. In fact, <laughs> you only really get what you've already given. You know that, right? I mean, that's what we've been saying for two nights. You only really ever get what you've already given. The clarity you get comes from the truth that you've already put out there. You just don't recognize it as a truth until the storyteller or the biographer tells it back to you. But you already put it out there. You already gave it. So the Rebbe is saying, this is just the way the universe was built, the reciprocal nature of things. And that would be true for any human being. But now let's get Jewish for a second. Because you're a Jew. I'm speaking to you as a Jew. So let's get even more specific here. Okay? Uh, so far I've been speaking in general terms. When the individual in question happens to have the good fortune of being a Jew, his duties and obligations go infinitely further. How much further? Infinitely further. Meaning it's not comparable. How much more is a Jew obligated than a non-Jew? I guess what's 613 divided by 7? So like 90, 90 times more? No. <laughs> it's not quantifiable. It's infinitely more because it's like a different thing. It's a different level of obligation. Especially in this day and age, a Jew is obligated. Especially in this day and age, after one third of our people, quantitatively and, hold on, one second. I've got to flip the page. Yeah, here. And much more so qualitatively have been annihilated. Talk about the Holocaust. For everyone who has been spared, that fate must now contribute not only his normal share, but also make up the terrible gap that has been, uh, been created in the life of our tortured people. One must now work for at least towards the preservation of our people and the fulfillment of its destiny. Okay, so basically, in general, every human being has to give. You have to be a giver. But how much more so a Jew, and how much more so 
you know, that would be a Jew in, living in any age, in any day, but especially a Jew in today's day and age, right after the Holocaust, there's so much needed from you. It's not funny how much is needed from you. As for the question, now it seems from this, the way that Rebbe writes it, that this is a question that the guy asked. It's interesting. And sometimes people ask you like technical questions or philosophical questions, uh, as opposed to like I'm saying like hadracha questions where they're asking for guidance. And it seems like this guy peppered in sort of a philosophical question. And you see the Rebbe is not only answering the question, but using that question as part of giving this person a path in life. Okay. Uh, as for the question, wherein lies the preservation of our people? And what is its historic destiny? Okay. Apparently the guy asked something to that effect. The answer is not difficult to find if we examine the pages of our history throughout the many centuries of our sojourn among the nations of the world. It is neither power nor country. See, that I was not a Zionist. <laughs> there was no one who was bigger in supporting the Israeli military and, the, and safety and security and never giving away an inch of territory, but that was not a Zionist. Okay. Our security is not from having a country. Nor even a common language that preserved us in the past. Okay, Those are not the things that preserved us in the past, but our Jewish way of life in accordance with the Torah, Teres Chaim, the law of life, and mitzvahs, whereby Jews live. Those who sought new ways or staked the future of our people on other factors, and there were such groups at, who made such attempts, such as the Kuthites, the Sadducees, the Hellenists, Karaites, etc., disappeared without a trace. Only the eternal Torah and mitzvahs, the true Jewish way of life, preserved us in the past, as will preserve us in the future. This is the golden thread that runs throughout our long history. Okay, now that sounds very like general, like that's a speech you could give to any Jew. All right, so now that it gets personal again, okay? Because trust me, that paragraph wasn't just thrown in there to give like a you know a general speech. No, it was all a lead up to getting personal again. Here we go. If the person turning to me with such a problem as you describe were a Gentile, I would say to him, you are too much wrapped up with yourself, with your own emotions and feelings and aspirations. Okay, so that was being a little bit harsh here. And, and the Rebbe has earned it at this point because the Rebbe proved that he heard this guy's story. He understood the story. Okay? I heard, I listened. I listened. I'm, I'm telling you back details of your story. All right? And now, I'm going to tell you, it's a little harsh, but if a non-Jew were to tell me all this, I would say, man, you are too much wrapped up with yourself, with your own emotions and feelings and aspirations. Stop being concerned with your own problems. The way to cope with, an emo with, with such an emotionally charged situation is to stop trying to cope with it. Ha! I love it. The way to cope with such an emotionally charged situation is to stop trying to cope with it. You must get away from yourself and begin to think of others. It is time to begin an active participation in the society, to give and give generously. The opportunities are many and the need is great. You have your choice, social work, charitable, or even scientific, right? Even be a scientist. Maybe you'll, you know, Cure disease, do something, some contribution. But you are a Jew, and your obligations go beyond the above. You must live like a Jew in your daily life, the Jewish way of life, the way of the Torah and the mitzvahs, and you must use your influence with others in the same direction. In other words, it's not enough that you do Torah and mitzvahs. You have to influence other Jews to do Torah and mitzvahs as well. And you see here, The Rebbe is a rabbi. Of course, the Rebbe is going to give Jewish advice. Of course, no letters complete without a pitch for Torah and mitzvahs. But here's the thing that I always love about it. It's never a tagged on, like, well, and now that we spoke on a human level, let's throw in some Yiddishkeit. Right? <laughs> I hate that. You know, that's, oh, that's like the, you know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of frum people, like Orthodox people I know. It's like, well, you know, for his kashras, we'll learn Lukutei Sichas, but if you really want to know how to live life, you listen to Jordan Peterson on YouTube, right? Like, you listen to Torah, 
classes because you know it makes you feel holy. But then, if you want to know how to really live life, you you know, then it's uh, Stephen Covey, right? All right. And what I'm saying is, the Rebbe gets to the Yiddishkeit, the Jewish part of it, so naturally. I'm talking to you about your problem, and I'm talking to you about the solution to your problem. And I cannot fully convey to you that solution. If you are a non-Jew, I guess I could. I could just give you a general human advice. But you're a Jew. In order to give you your solution and your path out of this, I have to talk about Torah and mitzvahs. I'm not adding Torah and mitzvahs to it. Torah and mitzvahs are, are, are essential to your path forward. Some people think the Torah and the Jewish way is quote-unquote old-fashioned. But they are both misguided and unscientific. I love that. It's unscientific to think Torah is old-fashioned. Truth never gets too old, can never get stale. Only falsehood, half-truth, and compromise cannot last long. But truth is enduring and timeless. It may require courage and resolution to change one's way of life. But these are qualities with which youth is generously endowed. You're, he was a young guy he was talking to. And you are a young man, 19 as you write. You are capable of facing this challenge boldly. You have to empower people. You have to use any piece of evidence they gave you to remind them how great they are and how much they can accomplish. If you told me something like your age, I'm going to use it against you, quote unquote, to empower you. You told me you're 19. All right, I'm adding that to my list when I need to fight dirty and I need to prove to you that you're great. When I need to prove to you, <laughs> what did Christopher Robin tell Winnie the Pooh, right? You're more courageous. Than, how do I know that? Because I saw it on a refrigerator magnet. Somebody could Google it and put it in the chat. Like Christopher Robin told Winnie the Pooh. I think he would know. That's, I don't know. That was, a, that was the picture on there. was a picture of Winnie the Pooh on a refrigerator magnet. You're greater than you believe and more courageous than you think. Okay. Anyways, but that's why do you think that resonates? Why do you think people like lines like that? Because that's what they want to hear. That's what they need. To, it's, an, it's not just feel good pablum. It's, that's what, it's the truth. It's the truth. You are the hero of your story, and you have so much that the world needs from you. So you're 19. I'm going to use that piece of information to build my case. You're young. You have energy. You're able to face this challenge boldly, that Abba says. All right, let's finish it up. We are now in the very auspicious days of El, when the old year is about to give way to the new. This is the time of teshuva. <sighs> teshuva is usually translated as repentance, the turning over of a new leaf. It is this and more. See, with the Rebbe, it's never, you think it's this, it's not that. It's also that, but it's even more. <laughs> I learned that, by the way. You never say, it's not that. Oh, you think it's that, it's not that. No, it, it's also that. And more. Teshuvah isn't just turning over a new leaf. Yes, it's that and more. For the real meaning of Teshuvah is return. Return to the source. The source of truth, purity and holiness. The very essence of the Jew, whose soul is truly a part of the divine above. Again, I said it last night, and I'll say it again. Your job is to play shadchin, matchmaker, between this person and his or her true self. You are facilitating their teshuva, their return. Their return to what? Return to their true self. You don't have what they need, but they do. And your job is to point it out to them. Whatever they need for their job, 
or may I say, whatever they need to do what they're needed for, they possess already. And their only problem is they don't know it. And since they don't know that they already have what they need to do what they're needed for, they're coming to you presenting a list of quote-unquote problems that they've identified in their life. But those aren't the problems. Those are actually solutions. That's all part of character development and conflict resolution. And all that needs to be done is this hero needs to discover their truth. And you should be humbled and grateful that Hashem trusted you enough. Forget about that this person trusted you. You can fool people. But Hashem trusted you to be there, to be the one who's going to help this person be introduced to their true self. I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll finish the letter, wishing you a with blessing, the Rebbe's holy signature. So I, I'll tell you one of my favorite igris. It's in Hebrew, so I'll paraphrase, translate, but it's in the, in the igris Kedish. The letter to the Rebbe from Ashliach. Meisha Yitzchok Hacht from New Haven, Connecticut. Now, normally it wouldn't be important to say the name, but you'll see from uh, the story that here it is. So Meishe Yitzchok Hecht was a shliach in New Haven, Connecticut. He wrote to the Rebbe a desperate letter. In fact, I found out from his family, it wasn't just a letter, it was a parcel. It had the keys to the building. He had a day school in New Haven and he was done. He was done. He was completely beyond, beyond, beyond. He sent the Rebbe a letter of resignation with the keys to the building. He said, the Rebbe, I'm giving you the building. I'm made. So the Rebbe writes back and uh, says, let me see if I even have it on my hard drive because I just love it so much. Maybe I have it. Do I have it? Ah, 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 ah. I do have it. Oh, good. I'm happy with myself that I have it. Share screen. <laughs> so the never writes back to him like this. Terem yikro v'anien. That's a, that's a verse. God says to the Jewish people, he says, don't worry, before they call out, I have already replied. Right. So the Rebbe says, this shliach is writing and saying, I'm done, I'm past my limit, I'm totally, I'm beyond, beyond, beyond. And the Rebbe says, eh, don't worry, it's already taken care of. Terem yikro v'anien. Before they call out, I've already answered. I already took care of your problem. I already, I already did what you wanted. Problems taken care of. I already took care of it, and I sent Moshe Yitzchok Hecht. <laughs> Who's that ever writing to? I mean, this is better than the story last night about the uh, wine rab, about Medaf Red and Suzich. <laughs> that I was saying, I took care of your problem. I, I, I took your advice and, and, I, and I sent in the cavalry. I sent Moshe Yitzchok Hacht. He's writing to Moshe Yitzchok Hacht. Okay, Ukenira, but it's apparent. From this letter and the previous letter, apparently he wrote two hysterical letters, not just this one. <laughs> your problem is, I sent Moshe Yitzchok Hacht. And you don't know him. Ain't him a kira means you don't know him. now. You don't know him or the powers that he was given. That's your problem. You don't know yourself and your power. We all call upon him. So therefore, at the very least, you should at least get to know him now. <laughs> He's talking to Maisha Yitzchak Hecht about Maisha Yitzchak Hecht. You should get to know this Maisha Yitzchak Hecht. And if you do, Take of a miyad immediately. Yishtana hakol, everything will change. A matzav ruach, a betachin ba'ashem, a simcha yem yemis v'chulu v'chulu. Your 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 mood, your your trust in God, your day to day uh, happiness, etc. etc. Askel al atziyin. I will mention it at the resting place of my father in law. And by the way, askel al atziyin. I just want to mention one thing. Um, askel al atziyin like I translated just now, means I will mention it at the resting place of my father-in-law. In addition to answering people, the Rebbe would go to the oil, to his father-in-law's resting place. You know how many times 
I wanted to respond in that column. I don't have an answer for you, but if you send me your name and your mother's name, I will mention you at the aisle. Now, I would say it right now, and I thought about it actually. I thought about maybe I want to finish off tonight's webinar by saying, you know what? If you want me to mention you at the oil, I'll mention you at the oil. Send me your name and your mother's name, and I'll mention you at the oil. But I decided, no, I'm not going to make that offer. I'm not making that offer, and I'll tell you why. <sighs> because even if you stop using me for your answers, then what are you going to do? You're going to use me to go to the Rebbe for you. You don't need that. You want to meet me at the aisle and learn something from the Rebbe's Torah before you go in? Contact me. Anyone who says they're going to the aisle and they want to sit down and learn a sikha or a maimer before they go into the, to the aisle, if I'm in town, I will meet you there. 100%. Be my greatest privilege. As long as you don't ask me to tell you what the Rebbe answered. Okay? Because I don't have special powers and I can't help you with that. Figure it out on your own. I'm the Rebbe, the Gefin and Aveg, Vita Enferin. The Rebbe will figure out how to answer you, and you'll figure it out, okay? So don't come out of the, the oil and ask me the answer. I don't know the answer. But if you want to sit down, you want to learn a sikha, learn a mimer at the oil, that would be my greatest privilege. Oh, thank you. Thank you for posting that. 226-20 Francis Lewis Boulevard. And there's the phone number. There's the fax number, as well as the, the email if you cannot attend. I am very, very fortunate that I live very close to the oil and I'm there multiple times a week. Um, and it's the holiest place in the world until uh, Mashiach. Yes, I said that and I can explain to you based on a sicha, I'll be nigla according to Jewish law why that's true. At any rate, um, there's a lot more to be said. We could probably do a third section. There's a lot more I have. <laughs> I have these papers with my notes and like have pages and pages of more things that I wanted to say. Um, I'll finish with a story from David Taub. David Taub is one of the smartest people that I know. And he's known as a puppeteer, as the Ichikaduzi guy. Everybody thinks he's funny. You, you know what people don't realize? They think David's the funny one and I'm the smart one. He's the smart one and I'm the funny one. I'm, I'm the frustrated comedian. Anyways, but I'm going to tell you a David Taub story, and then I'm going to finish. So uh, my brother David had a toothache, and he went to our Uncle Gary, all of us shalom. Gary just passed away this year. This is Michelle Mishnah and Aliyah. <sighs> Gary was a dentist. And... Um, so David went to uh, Uncle Gary, and Uncle Gary told him, you, your tooth abscessed. It's rotten inside. You, uh, you have to get it removed. He says, but that's for an oral surgeon. I'm not a surgeon. I'm a dentist. I could cap it for you. And if I cap it, it won't hurt anymore. But that's the problem, because if it doesn't hurt, then you're not going to want to get surgery. And if you don't get surgery, the infection is going to spread, and it can be very dangerous. So if I cap it for you, you have to promise me first that you're not going to become slothful about going to an oral surgeon. I'll cap it for you, but you're going to, be, you're going to have relief. You're going to have so much relief, you're going to think you can, you can wait, but you can't wait. So I'll cap it for you if you promise that you're going to go to an oral surgeon right away. And that's what happened. So afterwards, you know, the Baal Shem Tov said, von alts was mezet, von alts was mehert, darf mena reis nemen ahiro nevedes Hashem. So uh, the Baal Shem Tov said, everything you see in here, you have to take out uh, a lesson in serving Hashem. So my brother David said, what did I learn? I come to Uncle Gary, he says, really, you need an oral surgeon. Oh, and you told him the problem with your tooth is in the root. And I can't do that. I can't deal with the root. I can deal with the external parts. I can put the cap on. So David says like this, what's the nimshal? That's a marshal. What's the nimshal? That's the analogy. What's the analog? A Jew comes to you and has a problem. And really, you see that it's a deep problem. It goes down to the root. To shayrish nishmasay. And really, only the surgeon can take care of it. 
the one who knows how to see a shayrish hanashama. Only a rabbi who can see the soul and the source of the soul, the root. But the person came to you. So what do you do? What you can do, you can make them comfortable. You give them a bowl of chicken soup and you fabrang with them and tell them a joke. And if they like profundity, so, you know, if you like the people on this uh, Zoom, you know, you like people like profundity, right? So some people don't care for profundity. They just want the joke. So you just give them the jokes. People like you. So you give them some deep stuff, some philosophy. Okay, very nice. All right. But all you're really doing is making them comfortable. And what you have to do is you have to, now you can't necessarily get them to promise because they may not be ready for it, but you have to promise yourself. I'm only making you comfortable for as long as it takes me to get you to the surgeon who can deal with the root. I'm a dentist, not a surgeon. I can put a cap on your tooth. I can deal with the externalities. But what you need is deeper than that. And what the, the, the occupational hazard is, what I'm going to offer you is going to afford you some level of comfort. See, here's the problem. When someone reaches out to you, like I said earlier, they're probably having a bad day, if not the worst day of their life. And on the worst day of someone's life is the day when you can tell them, go to the aisle. And if I had the guts, that's what I would answer everybody, but I don't. So instead, what do I do? I say, you know what? I'll make the guy comfortable, but I'm only making him comfortable until I can get him to the Rebbe who can deal with the Shadish, who can deal with the root. So here's what I'm telling you. If you feel that I've given you any degree of clarity, if you feel that I gave you any peace of mind, and you feel any level of appreciation to me, please don't cause me to be complicit in the crime of giving you enough comfort not to go to the surgeon who deals with the root. I'm asking you that if I ever gave you any clarity or peace of mind, please go to the aisle. Write your name in your mother's name on a piece of paper. Take it to the oil. Tear it up. Leave it there. Whatever you say other than that, that's your business. I, I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. And now I want to uh, remind you of the duty that you have to share your gifts. And... Um, let me close with a prayer that very soon we should enter the age when no man will teach his fellow saying, come and know the Lord, for all will know me, says God. Okay, thank you very much and good night.